Thank you guys for coming out and uh, welcome to the panel on uh, urban cycling. I'm uh, Kirk Boone and I uh, run a company called the Messenger A41 Project. It's kind of like a hybrid. Um, I design messenger style products and uh, document metro messenger culture with bugs and also do some consulting in the uh, cycling industry. So I'm going to keep presentations pretty short and just get right into it because there's a lot of information here that I mean my personally I want to get out and at the end of the day I hope to get what has the messenger culture been on the impact of the cycling business and so um, that's kind of like been my dream since I've been running the messenger A4 project and looking at cycling and how messengers have really pushed uh, this industry and kind of made it unique. So uh, I'm going to start off to my far left with uh, Jeff Scully. He's the president of uh, Ortley Waterproof. So Jeff, uh, tell us like who you are and what you do for Ortley Waterproof Sweet, USA. Thank Thanks. Um, actually, I'm president of Ortlieb USA. We're the wholly owned subsidiary of Ortlieb of Germany, still manufacturing all of our products in our own factory in Bavaria, Germany, to this day. Um, still owned by the same gentleman whose name is on the product, Mr. Ortlieb. Uh, started the company in, uh, in his mother's basement in 1982, and uh, he's still our chief designer, our chief technologist, and the man at the top. And we distribute all of the product for the U.S. market out of our offices in the Seattle, <coughs> Washington area. We've been actually established in the United States now 20 years. Great. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin Bolger. Tell us who you are and what do you do at uh, CycleHawk and what is CycleHawk? Thanks, Kurt. I'm, uh, my name is Kevin Bolger. I'm a bicycle messenger in New York City. I started working in 1992 and I formed my own company in 2006 and I just love being part of uh, bicycle culture and it's been a lot of fun seeing it grow and change and I'm, I'm happy that the uh, bike messenger industry is a positive part of the entire thing that's going on. You know? Right, okay, great. Uh, next up is Daryl Slater. Um, uh, tell us what you do for Kryptonite Locks and who you are. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, thanks for pulling this together. Oh, no problem, man. Um, so my name is Daryl Slater. I am the brand manager for Kryptonite Bike Locks. We are located uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, I've been with Kryptonite for just about 10 years. Um, and we are sold globally. So in more than, uh, I'd say right now, about 28, 29 countries um, and have been in business um, for about 44 years. Great, and uh, here is uh, JC Ramirez, and tell us who you are and uh, what do you do for um, Cyclo uh, Bicycle Supply? Thank you, uh, Kurt. Uh, my name is JC Ramirez, and I'm working for Cyclo Bicycle Supply, and I'm the marketing manager, uh, dealing with uh, Chanel USA, Celeste Marco, Exposure Lights, and Billy. Great. Can you pass those water bottles now? Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. So, uh, my format for today is pretty straightforward. So, I'm going uh, to have a list of questions that I'm going to ask each panelist. And I ask uh, you guys to hold your questions towards the end. And then, whatever you guys want to ask, feel free to ask. <clears throat> so, I'm going to start off with uh, Jeff at uh, Ortley. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeff, when did you, when did Ortley Waterproof start uh, messaging, me, uh, making uh, messenger bags and, and why? Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, it's like a lot of the products that Ortley developed over the years, it came out of the marketplace, it came out of a request for uh, higher quality waterproof bags, higher volume bags than what the messengers were using in uh, places like Berlin and, and Nuremberg and Munich at the time. And since Ortlieb had a reputation already for making waterproof um, panniers and other high quality bicycle bags, there just was a, a natural connection there. They were seen in the market all over the cities, people going to work, going to the 
supermarket with uh, their bikes and carrying things and so the messengers just approached Mr. Ortlieb and asked him if he could create something for them and, and that was pretty much the genesis of it. You'll notice down here in front um, some, some of our uh, archive bags from, uh, from the early years. Um, we were involved in the first uh, world championship in Berlin in 1993. We actually made the, the sponsored bag for that event. And um, there's a few people in the room that actually remember when that was new. A couple old people like myself. Um, but, you know, the Germans are, are very uh, practical and they wanted to make sure that they were making a bag that not only was waterproof, um, but not necessarily stylish as much as function. So definitely function and uh, over form. So they made it, of course, as a backpack um, with two shoulder straps, which distributed the weight evenly and made for a very stable uh, way to carry your goods. Uh, great. Um, my next question is for Daryl at Kryptonite. Um, uh, how did Kryptonite U-Lock get developed and when did um, bicycle messengers adopt it for their use in their job? So the story of Kryptonite and then the history of Kryptonite is an interesting one. So back in the, really in the late 60s, early 70s, the only way you locked a bike was buying a chain from a hardware store. So someone would walk in off the streets and ask someone in a hardware store to pull links of chain off a spool and literally cut it right in front of them, and then they'd go out and couple that with a padlock. Um, so Michael Zane, who founded the company in 1971, um, had this idea. His father worked at a machine shop in Boston. He had this idea that if you bent iron, um, you could make this U-shape and lock your bike. And it was going to give you a much better chance to protect your bike than with chain links um, that you saw cut in front of you, ironically enough. And so the, uh, this bent iron with a spring-loaded mechanism was the first ever U-lock. And so that evolved, and then really in New York uh, was Kryptonite's coming out party. So we're based in Boston, but really consider New York City uh, probably our home. Because there's the story of Michael um, locking a bike outside of the Second Ave bike shop in Greenwich Village and watching the bike be attacked for 30 days and 30 nights. <laughs> Um, and everything that was removable on the bike was stolen except for the frame itself. And that kind of propelled Kryptonite. He got a lot of publicity. Um, you know, he did some, some, some PR with it. But that really propelled uh, Kryptonite as a brand, um, and in, in particularly in New York City. And messengers, as the messenger movement started to grow and more and more companies popped up, um, suddenly as you walked into a, a bike shop in New York City, <clears throat> if you asked for a bike lock, uh, Kryptonite was the name, and then they would recommend that. So really the earliest, I would say, would probably be um, mid-80s, and then as the, the movement took over um, and more and more companies popped up, you saw Kryptonite really starting to get more brand awareness uh, with messengers specifically. Uh, so, um, you know, Kevin's been working with uh, Kryptonite a long time um, uh, as well, and so when did the ULOT kind of like become part of this uh, the mess, what you call the messenger look, and I'll, I'll throw that at Kevin, and, and you, you and you and Daryl can share on your answer on that. Well, I, when I started uh, in '92, it was this in New York. The crime was really high, and there was a big problem with crack. It was a huge issue in the city, and to to take a bike was an easy. It was an easy way for someone to make. 20, 30 bucks really quick. So it kind of became a target of people who had these drug addictions. So basically, if you couldn't secure your bike properly, chances are, I had two bikes stolen when I was in my first year working as a bike messenger. And partially because I wasn't locking it the best way I could, and also partially because it was crazy out there, you know? And then I started, um, using the kryptonite lock because that was that was the lock that people said oh yeah they can't beat this lock mm -hmm. you know so part part of the reason why and i think it was was it a different color scheme back then right it was yeah. green but then you guys had some issues with dc comics or something yeah. like that but i think um even the chain and padlock kryptonite makes the quadra chain right which is like a four-sided chain which is harder to cut than the usual chain link so i also used a a lot of messengers use the uh, quadra chain with the padlock as well, partly because you can secure your bike in a lot of different places, including to the big uh, street uh, lamps. And also having the chain around your waist was kind of like a message to people saying, hey, you know, if you want, if you want some trouble, it's, you know, let me take off my chain and show you what you're getting into, you know? So 
It was a little bit of both. It was okay. protection for your bike and also to let people know you weren't messing around. Oh, that's, you know? that's interesting. I didn't know you. I, I knew you could use it as a weapon, but I, I didn't think that was in the concept or the use of a lot. <laughs> now I'm pretty sure sense. Kryptonite doesn't endorse the use of that as a <laughs> for, for, for protection only, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you've seen it in some movies and in some different TV shows at times. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I've, I've run into some girl messengers, and you know, you get bad with me, I'll whip this lock out and you know, pound you with it. So that's kind of interesting. So. Um, so I'm getting to the, the kind of crust of why I wanted to do this panel is um, the culture, the messenger culture itself and how the work that messengers do on the streets have actually become this uh, business, if you might want to say. So um, they have this thing called um, alley cat racing that messengers do that's kind of taken off around the world. And so maybe I'll go with JC on this one. Um, there's this particular race called Moss Track in New York that uh, was started and uh, they use these, they call them track bikes, some call them fixed gear bikes, but um, these bikes were made for the velodrome, not for the streets. And messengers kind of adopted it into their work in the streets. And from that became a, a kind of a movement and um, in some cases, Mosh Track was maybe an inspiration for that. So for uh, JC, describe uh, why Mosh Track Alley Cat Race is unique and the bicycle messenger culture of riding track bikes, or I mentioned earlier, fixed gear bicycles for messenger work on city streets. And how did this part of messenger culture inspire a global business, an innovative product like the collaboration between Chanelli, Mash, and cycling races like the Red Hook Crit? So there's a lot in that question. So let's let's just break it down uh, with JC first. Is um, what is what is Mantra Track and um, tell us why messengers use track bikes on the streets. Okay, so uh, Monster Track is um, a, an alley cat, but what is separate from any other alley cat is because it's only used by uh, a race on a track bicycles, which is one single gear. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with it, but it's just one gear, no brakes. It's very simple, and it only, you only can go forwards. I mean, you can go for, uh, backwards if you want to. So the key pedal is fixed. So. Um, one day, I invited my friends. We, we were like a group of three people riding fixed uh, uh, bicycles in New York doing messenger. So I was into Alicat, so I invited them to participate in one. So after that, we get together and we were kind of like not happy about our results, of course. But uh, we were saying that probably we should do um, only alley cat race for only fixed gear. So that's how the concept of Monster Track, it became a reality after my friend um, decided to throw a alley cat on his birthday in the coldest month of the year, which is February. So it was very cold and it's a brutal race. Snake. So a snake, yeah, yeah. which is living in here in Philadelphia. He got married, so he told me, um, if I want to keep doing the monster track when, when he left. So I took over monster track after he left. So I started organizing. And I think that's why kind of like the golden years of monster track, I would say. And uh, actually my friend, Hodari, he helped me off to organize a couple of them. And he, he found a really nice place to throw the party, which was a boat in New York City, called it the fry pan. And I think that was, the golden years of Monster Track, oh, yeah. where it was really a lot of people, over 160 people from all over the world. So I think that um, inspired all the people to actually ride track bikes and start the boom of, of the culture like and what it is right now. So, um, was the... <laughs> okay, uh, was the next? no, that's great. No, um, then the next part of that, okay. So this inspired, uh, now it's a global business, right? And um, 
And can you can you tell me a little bit about the since you're working with um, Cyclo now uh, on the innovation part of these 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 track bikes and what manufacturers are actually trying to do with these bikes because they're actually trying to innovate and make these bikes really really special for urban urban cycling and not for the actual track. And one of those things was the Chanel Mash. So do you know much about the Chanel Mash relationship? Yeah, so um Chanel Mash and, and they got partnered and they start doing these uh, frames, a specific uh, fixed gear. And I think that was uh, the boom of the whole culture because these guys uh, create a video about the visit in New York City like living the lifestyle, which was riding fixed gear, going for a races, and be just be part of the whole community. And I think after that, it created a route because they did a visualize, uh, um, like a show, like everybody saw that video, the MASH video, I, I believe everybody remember it. And it was really good, I, I was watching it every day before I go to work, because it, it was really nice. So I think that inspired and give other companies to see that this kind of bicycles is is different and they got a different style than any other bike and it's utilized to work in the city and to race as well so it's kind of like professional but in the wild wild west which is racing in traffic in lights uh, uh, crossing red lights and almost hitting pedestrians, you know, not hitting it. So that's extremely so, dangerous, right? And yeah, of course, it's very dangerous. And, and I think uh, David Trimble saw this when he participated in Monster Track, one of the Monster Tracks. But he organized the first record creed, kind of inspired on Monster Track, but he did it of his own style. He did a, a 20, 20 laps and like a creed uh, style. So I think that's why um, a lot of people see this culture as a um, way to put the products out there. No, that's great, that's great. Yeah. So now can I, I'm I, just, Can I just oh, throw yeah. in real quick? I yeah. think the whole thing with the track bike, as, at least in New York, it was, when I started out as a messenger, I started out on a, on a mountain bike, and then I saw that bike messengers were riding these brakeless, stripped down, just, two wheels and a frame bike. And the appeal to the bike messengers, I think, was that it was easy to take care of. In the winter time, you didn't have to, after you work all day and your bike is covered with snow and grime and everything, you didn't have to worry about adjusting your brake cables or your derailleur. You just had this bike, all you had to do was keep air in the tires, basically. So it was a popular bike for work. And so many messengers were using the, the brakeless track bike for work and no one really, it wasn't a big deal, but there was peop There were some of us, most of us in our, tw our 20s, who thought we were faster than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whole idea came from, to start saying, who, well, who's really the fastest? How are we gonna find out? Right, you know? right. Now, <clears throat> kind of like the style thing also, there was a photographer came into the, the messenger community and saw you guys and decided to do a book called Messenger Styles that kind of like identified this subculture. And then like, Kevin, you was involved with that a little bit. You too, JC, you guys were uh, in that book. Mm. And what was that like? You just went to the photographer's studio and you said, hey, you guys are styling that. Actually, that guy, ch he chased us around a lot for a while, <clears throat> trying to get everyone together. But he just, he was a persistent guy and he set up some studio time, I think over the course of a week. And he had as many people come in as possible and be, uh, get their photos taken. And then he got the book published. And I guess it was a, it was a, a really nice book. It was different and it kinda, it was picked up by Fashion Institute of Technology. They used it at, in one of their classes, I remember. And it, it was just kinda, it was capturing the street style, which is not like, you're not trying to be fashionable. Like, this is just the way you dress. That's how we look. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. have a bandana because you <laughs> gotta wipe your yeah, face yeah. every once in right, a while, right, stuff right. like that, you know? Yeah, so it became style. So I, I, I used to go in Bloomingdale's and I'd be in beat up jeans and old t shirt and like, sure, I'm styling. I, I'm supposed to look like a bump, but 
all of a sudden I'm, uh, I look like I'm styling. So because kids were into the dingy t-shirts, cut up jeans, it just, it's, a, it's a whole fashion thing going on now. But before, before that, you would look like a bum. So that's great for us, us Mexicans. So while I'm on the Alley Cat um, stories, is um, Kevin, tell us what is the Alley Cat race? Break it down, and as far as your history now, it's where, where did it come from? Well, basically, it's kind of like a scavenger hunt on bicycles. So imagine, you know, uh, the first one I was involved with, we just, it basically, it's a, you get a sheet of paper at the start and it has a certain amount of places that you have to go to and you might have to perform a task at each place and then you get a stamp and you bring it back to the finish and whoever gets there first is the winner, you know? So I believe, I, I know in New York, we were inspired by the Messenger World Championships, which started in Berlin in 1993. The first one in North America was 95 in Toronto. So when I went to that, I, it, I, it awakened me to, to this culture. There was like, I was like, oh, bike messengers get together and have fun and stuff. So for, for me, it was just a job and I didn't know bike messengers were cool or other bike messengers in New York were, it was just like a job. You hung out with the people in your company and after work you would go to Washington Square Park if you wanted to drink beer or whatever, but there was no real, um, only time people would come together is when someone uh, would get se severely injured or uh, get killed on the job. You know, like uh, Hodari, uh, I think you stuck a flyer in my wheel in like 93 to, to go to a memorial service for a bike messenger that was killed on Madison Avenue. And like, oh, in so in New York, we weren't really aware of like this whole fun aspect of it. At least I wasn't until we went to the world championships. And all of a sudden I was like, wow, people do this all over the place and everyone's having a good time. So. That inspired me to organize one in New York. And then it just kind of, uh, it was a fun thing that kind of took off. And like, I think as far as uh, companies that help out with prizes and sponsorship, I think they see that, <clears throat> from what I understand is they'll, they'll see bike messengers as maybe not the, their best consumer, because bike, a lot of bike messengers don't have a lot of money, but bike messengers are influencers in the sense that they're out there all the time and they're highly visible, and what are the products they're using? Are they using a bag that's gonna uh, get through the winter? Are they using a lock that's gonna keep their bike in one place? Then I think people put two and two together and say, oh, all the bike messengers use that, then that's why I'm gonna go to the, to the store and buy, you know? At least that's what I keep telling my sponsors, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna swing it over to uh, Jeff while we're on that sponsorship question. Okay, so Hartley Waterpool sponsored the first Cycle Messenger World Championship in Berlin in 1993 and have since sponsored many more urban cycling and messenger events. What has this kind of sponsorship meant to your brand? <clears throat> well, I mean, it's visibility. I mean, Kevin's absolutely right. If, if you see a professional using a product, you hope that there's a correlation between durability and functionality that translates to somebody who certainly isn't going to put the bag through the same paces that a pro uh, like these guys would do. So that's part of it. Visibility is part of it. But the other part of it is, you know, um, it's two part. One is we, we take pride in what we do. We think that our bags are the best and we like to see the professionals using our product because we think we can make their life better and make their um, you know, become more profitable, be able to carry more, be comfortable, be safe on the bike. And, you know, it's, it's important for us that we're giving back in that regard. And then we get great feedback from, from users. I mean, nobody beats up a bag like a messenger. I mean, these guys hammer their product and they put, they put 10 years of life into a, in a bag that you know, they've been on the street for six to 12 months. And we get a lot of valuable feedback on how we can improve our product and make them more durable and, and make them safer. So uh, it's really, really valuable. It's a valuable relationship for us. Oh, great, great. So, uh, Daryl, uh, did the uh, endorsement by Bicycle Messengers extend to making the kryptonite lock brand well known for locking up your bicycle in urban cities in addition to your U-Lock obtaining cult status 
among bicycle messengers and urban cyclists. So basically, it's like almost the same question to Master and Jeff, yeah, but yeah. So more I can, so for the lots. Yeah, so I can pick up on what Jeff was saying, because it's very true in the world of security. So when you think of a bike messenger, I mean, the relationship, it, it works. When we talk about bike messengers um, in the world of kryptonite, there are super users. So in any type of product testing environment, as Jeff said, you know, a messenger locks and unlocks their bike anywhere from 20 to, I mean, 20 to 40 times a day, and it could be more. You know, I think on average when we did the messenger project, um, we looked at potentially, you know, as high as 50, stop, 50 runs a day, uh, as low as maybe 15 to 20. So a messenger in the course of a month is operating a key in a cylinder more than the average weekend warrior or even like a commuter may do in a year, um, to Jeff's point about the durability. So when we talk about needing feedback about whether or not a key works, a cylinder works, um, you're going to go to a messenger. And then you know if you're a commuter, again back to kind of that awareness piece, if you're a commuter and you see that a messenger is doing that and they're locking and unlocking more in one day than you will in a month, um, you know that that has to speak to quality. So from a strictly um, durability, quality, and ease of use perspective, messengers are the best um, testers of your product you're going to have. And quite honestly, what I appreciate is you know, the likes of Squid and JC, they're going to give you honest feedback. They're going to tell you when something works really well and when something doesn't work for them and they miss, they miss being where they need to be because that's the livelihood in terms of delivery. They're going to let you know about that as well and you're going to take that feedback like it's gold. So that's kind of the, the strictly product testing piece. And then just from a kind of a an awareness in an urban area, kind of the, the cool factor of, um, you know, people ask me in, in, in certain countries when we talk about messages and they say, but it's just a lock, it's a piece of steel, it's a mechanical lock. How is it in Cosmo magazine? How is it um, something that's featured in, in TV shows? And why are people helping, uh, what's his name, George, Joseph, uh, Gordon, Joseph, Joseph Gordon Joseph Levitt, Gordon -Levitt uh, with learning how to ride like a messenger? How did, how did that even happen? Well, it's the years of, as Kurt saying, the years of really um, people looking to the messenger culture and understanding um, really just the, the trends, the vibe, survival on the streets, and you know, Kryptonite's really proud to have been part of that in terms of the durability, the reliability, and easy to use. Because at the end of the day, as Jeff said, we want to make sure that it's going to make their life and their profession easier, so they can do what they need to do. It's keep that bike safe, so they can do the next job. Wow, that's great. No, that's, that's 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 really great. Powerful how. You know, these movie producers want to come you use messengers in their movies and, oh, this guy needs a track bike in a U-lock. So, to look like it, you know, it's, it's, it's an identity kind of thing. So, um, uh, JC, that's, uh, you you work with quite a few brands over the years. Um, and uh, can you tell us about your experiences? And I'm just going to run off a, through a few of them that JC's worked with. And that's uh, Pluma, uh, Swatch, and Cleverhood. Can you tell me you know, your experiences working with these brands and uh, how important the messenger culture was in, to them in, in terms of uh, we need to use you guys for our, our advertising? Well, like, yeah, like these guys have mentioned, like when a company approaches you, it's because they know that they will have the best feedback uh, through the messengers. Uh, but in this case, it's because. Um, when we work, when I worked with Swatch, uh, they were looking the image. So the image of a messenger is different for any other cyclist, any from commuter, from professional cyclist. So it's kind of like a mix of both. So it's very unique, and a lot of people seeing like a superheroes in the cities, you know, like with the glasses, helmets, and they look really different. So the the, the companies they like that look and where they want to produ uh, show a product and they show it uh, with a bike message, they show it. I mean, the bike message is like a badass guy, you know, like this go to the city, ride every day, fight with the traffic, surviving every day because it's a very dangerous uh, job. So they want that kind of image of the messenger that is very unique besides any other cycling uh, that exists. So I think that's why they come into the bike message. Right, and so Kevin, um, you can follow up on that answer. You you work with quite a few brands as well. So, um, what 
what has the appeal been for these brands? And since they're using bike messengers, do you think that their marketing initiative has increased sales and exposure for their brand? So you, you had a really good relationship with Pluma. Can you maybe use that as an example? Um, all right, yeah, Puma North America approached us in 2004 about, uh, I think it was the vice president of the entire company, Puma, told the North American arm that I want you to do something with bike messengers. And I don't know exactly how that got, uh, came down the pipe or whatever, but they approached us and they said, hey, we wanna, we wanna engage with the bike messenger community and we wanna do something that's gonna uh, help you guys, but also promote our brand. So I, I feel like they, they saw when, when uh, companies are looking to promote and do things, they want to do something that's unique and different, but they also want to do something that's uh, sustainable. So I think maybe they saw that being involved with the messenger community was something that they're getting a piece of the city, you know, that's fun. Like bike, uh, in my experience, bike messengers are usually people who are interested in having fun and getting a, a having a good time and going fast and just full of life type of people. It's not the kind of job that people, or most people keep for a long time, but when people do it, it's, they're, they're very excited to do it and they're proud, proud about it as well. So I think that kind of energy is something that uh, Puma was interested in and they ended up, uh, we pitched the program to them about taking uh, our messengers that rode track bikes and bringing them to the, an actual velodrome and training at the velodrome and then creating a team. So we ended up making a team out of bike messengers who, and we also ended up racing on the track. And for three years, they sent us around the world racing. We raced all over North America. We went to uh, Australia and Japan. And I don't know if we ever made it to Europe, but it was just like, it was, it was kind of a world win type of thing, but it was also before the economic crash of 2008. Mm -hmm. So it was like a time, I guess, where they had disposable income, you know? So, and since then, since um, it changed a lot, but it, to me, it seems like companies that are interested in bike messengers are more uh, companies that are, uh, they're concerned about the durability and they're, they're looking to be used by, by cyclists. So companies that are interested in the cycling market and capturing the cycling, the cyclists uh, spare dollars, they, they, they like to associate with bike messages because we're kind of like the, um, I don't want to say rock stars, but like kind of like the, I don't know, misfit pirates or something. There's something uh, <coughs> interesting or romantic about it, you know? Yeah, so. no, that's, the, that's amazing. So the, the bike that you guys got made, was it a track bike? They had Cannondale. They contracted Cannondale to, make, uh, to get bikes for us all. It was, a, it was the, the major Taylor uh, model that was already in production, but they did a, a specific paint job for our team. Uh, that was Which a nice was, bike. Yeah, Did it was a nice bike. I, I destroyed mine three weeks after I got it. I, I got still it. have mine. Yeah. Oh, it has values. It's collectible now, right? I guess so. <laughs> oh. Maybe JC's is. Mine got... Yours yeah. is destroyed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm putting yeah. it on the eBay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm coming towards the end, so I'm, um, you know, you guys are going to get a chance to ask some questions. So, um, so, so Jeff, what are um, some of the new designs Audley Waterproof is providing for the uh, urban commuter, because you guys are in the urban space, and what, what are some new initiatives you're doing over there at Ortlieb? Well, again, you know, Ortlieb's tradition has been function over form, but having said that, uh, there are more and more people using their products in, in the urban environment, and, and not everybody wants to look like they just stepped off their bike when they walk into the lobby or into the office. So um, we, we use our uh, research and development time to find ways to give the same level of performance to products that have shapes and function that are consistent with our more durable stuff, our, our urban stuff, or our heavy duty panniers. And then we just try and soften the look a little bit without compromising uh, the integrity uh, and durability of the product. And so we're doing a lot of, spending a lot of time looking at new fabrics and finding ways to make the, 
the bag look a little softer, look a little more approachable, something that somebody would wear in a casual environment that doesn't make them look like a, a cyclist per se, but gives them that same waterproof protection and durability. I noticed you guys have a lot of new colorways too, right? A lot of new colorways. Yep. Yeah, well, it, was, it was basically basically one color for a long time, right? Yeah, red was the signature color and then yellow became number two in the state. So it's uh, now we're, we're spreading the palette out a little bit. Right, right. Um, uh, for Kryptonite, um, a few years ago, Kryptonite Locks developed an actual innovation team with messengers to create a new collection of urban cycling locks inspired by actually the messenger culture. Can you um, tell us what that process was like and what's been the outcome of that? Yeah, I mean, we just, Squid just said messengers are fun and like to party, so we figured, hey, let's make a project out of it. Um, so no, really, the, the project was, at the time, we were looking at a lot of changes in urban areas. So look at a Philly, look at a New York City, and there was a lot of, um, from a what you can and cannot lock to perspective, as cities are putting in more bike racks and diameters are changing, you got bike frames changing, we were starting to look and say, hey, you know, what's the next generation of U-locks? What type of changes do we need to make so that people, like a messenger, um, have what they need from a product perspective? So. Um, started with this guy right here and said, hey, listen, this is what we're thinking of putting together a messenger project and, and kind of looking at some uh, innovation. So we got a group together and really did some brainstorming sessions. It was one of the funnest projects I've ever worked on. Did it in uh, the streets of Brooklyn and New York City and really did a lot of walking around, did a lot of size studies of being with the messengers and looking at kind of their world and looking at the types of challenges they face. So as, as Squid will tell you, you know, on the streets of New York, you get scaffolding everywhere. So they don't have the ability to say, no, I'm gonna go lock two blocks this way where there's a proper bike rack. They may have to lock to a mail, you know, a mailbox, uh, scaffolding, anything they can quickly lock the bike to so they can get and do the delivery. So we looked at some of these challenges of locking and that was really a big part of the project and then let the messengers drive the product development process. Um, and what came out of it was kind of three basic needs that had to meet the messenger community. It was around um, durability, flexibility, and versatility. So one lock that can be used in multiple scenarios throughout the day, and then trying to have a one lock solution so that you didn't have to have multiple locks because the messenger doesn't want to carry more weight. So that was really the project, and out of it we had some, some product development, but it was really cool to get the feedback and work with them in the process. I mean, we sat in a room with all sorts of cool materials and different things, and I was like, holy cow, with this group of folks, I mean, it was an interesting group, and I thought, what are we gonna come out with in terms of a new design? <laughs> and what we learned, which was kind of cool, was we got some pretty positive kudos that they thought, hey, Kryptonite does a really good job, so it wasn't anything too, too revolutionary. It was more just kind of some minor adjustments here and there, and I could show you some products after. It was really making things a little taller, a little wider, uh, and then we did a, our first ever U-lock, which was really uh, kind of one of Squid's brainchilds working with the whole group, but a U-lock that has an extender. And when we first showed this in Europe, and people were like, why the hell hasn't anybody ever done that? And it was just a way to get frame and wheel without having to have a second lock. Um, and so that type of, you know, when we say first-hand feedback from messengers and really understanding kind of their world, and, and how they operate, um, it's really informed product development and process. So it's been, uh, it's been invaluable. It was a great wow, process. That's, that's, that's great. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna try, as I mentioned to you guys, I'm gonna try to put a number on this, this culture, um, at least with the industry, two industry reps we have here. So Jeff, and I'm just trying to get a number. So since I've been making messenger bags, have you all say, you don't have to give me an exact number, but has it been like more than, you so sold maybe more than 10,000 bags? And I would multiply that at retail. That, was, that would give me this number saying the value of this, this urban cycling thing that involves messengers. <laughs> um, jeepers, 25, 30 years of production, largely in Europe as well. And you, you, you know, you, in Europe, Ortlieb was the standard, industry standard for many, many years. and. Um, they had the opportunity to actually sell advertising on their backs. The privateers had a chance to sell advertising. And so we, we created these bags that were in the marketplace for six months and then the guys would turn them over and get a new advertiser and they'd get a new bag from a sponsor. And so, yeah, I, the number is probably um, well into the hundreds of thousands of bags over the, over the years just because of the, the total commercial market in, in Europe. 
So, yeah. Wow, that's, that's, that's pretty good. But the most important thing is that the technology that we, we used on this, this big professional courier bag, that trickled down to a, a more um, a more usable size for everybody. So we've got a, an everyday commuter bag that we've duplicated that same concept with that we've sold you know, thousands and thousands of for, for many, many years. So it's the same, same functionality. Same functionality. Oh, okay. It seems like the market has grown a lot too because there's, now there's so many bag companies, whereas back in the day there wasn't that many, many options. So. Yeah. Right. So, uh, Carol, would you be able to give me a guess on how many U-locks have <laughs> been pushed because of the culture and the movies and the whole message of Absolutely not. I um, wouldn't <laughs> be able to guess. But what I'll say is, um, no, I, I couldn't. What, what I would say, even bigger than like numbers, to be honest. Okay. I would say that the whole movement of minis, so there wasn't, years ago, there was no such thing as a mini U-lock. First, you know, the first few times someone spots someone with something orange sticking out of their back pocket riding around the streets of New York, I'm like, what's that? Oh, that's pretty cool. You can fit that in your back pocket. It took on this iconic status of, you know, the Evolution Mini 5. And now you could be in a bike shop in, in Rome, Italy. You could be in a bike shop on the West Coast. And someone will know, oh, that's the Mini. That's the Mini 5. And I really, I, you know, I would give... Um, the messenger culture and the messenger awareness in, in big urban areas, um, a lot of credit for creating what became a big category now because there's so many different SKUs that are different types of minis mm. with a cable, without a cable, this height, that height. Um, so one of our, you know, our, our top products uh, globally is a mini U-lock and I think a lot of that came from the work uh, and the visibility of messengers in urban areas. Wow, that's great. But the that's numbers crazy. would be the numbers would be pretty high. Okay, yeah. that's great. No, no, it sounds good. It sounds it sounds like I can't. I won't put a number on it since you're you're the, you're the guy, so I won't guess. But um, all right. So I'm gonna open the floor up to some questions. Anybody has questions, or I can keep this conversation going towards the end. But any questions out there? Right there. Go right in. Um, man, there's like a million things we could talk about in terms of messages. Is the safety aspect, you know, that you guys want to ride fast to get where you need to go. First of all, I'll just say that, that I, I did bike messenger work myself for a very short period of time because look like I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> so I have total respect for all bike messengers. Um, but there is, there is like a lot of pushback between the, the fact that you, you know, need to get where you need to go fast to make your deliveries and then how that affects people walking on the street you know, with the interaction between cyclists and pedestrians, um, the, the safety aspect of that. Um, and then there's also like, how do messengers get paid for their work? And, and is the pay model something that you'd maybe like to see different? Would that, would that change the industry in a, in, in a, in a positive way or, or a negative way? Um, the difference between what, what's a messenger and someone who's delivering, you know, food on on an on an e-bike, you know, which so is a big issue in New York City now too. Safety you know? is the first one you said, right? And I always thought um, the job is as dangerous as you want it to be, you know. And when I when I was in my twenties, it was a very dangerous job, and like I was, I could say I was an asshole, and I wouldn't yeah. be wrong, you know. But hey, I survived, and everyone around me survived, and now I ride. I think it's more important in my 40s with children. I think it's more important for me to make it home at the end of the day. And I've learned over the years that you're better off having a steady, constant pace than extremely fast and, oh my God, I can't stop type of thing. So if you're going 10 miles an hour all day long, you're going to make your money, and you're going to be fine. It's the people who are going 20 miles an hour for four blocks and then they got slammed to a screeching halt. That's, those are the people who are going to end up in the hospital or whatever. So, or take someone else. Yeah, or take someone else's hospital. And uh, luckily with cycling becoming more uh, popular, cities have, are building in infrastructure with bike lanes and public spaces, pedestrian spaces. Right. I think that's it's getting... question. Do messengers use the bike lanes or do they feel that that's too slow, a slow lane for them? I think it's really kind of, it, it depends on the individual, you know, and I, I use them when they're, uh, you know, convenient, but if a lot of times people park in the bike lanes as well. So if someone's parked in the bike lane, what are you going to do? I'm not going to wait for them to move, you know, I'm going to go around or whatever. Sure, could be a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of city cyclists get hurt because 
something's obstructing the bike lane and they get out in traffic. Yeah, but that's always going to be um, an issue, I guess. You know, and me personally, I feel like I'm a safe rider. I wear a helmet when I ride. You know, and then as far as the finances, I have my own small company and we pay our riders 65% commission. So if what, whatever amount of runs they do during the day, whatever we charge the clients, the biker gets 65% of that. So, and then on the weekends we pay 80%. We're, we're open on Saturdays as well. So to me, it's like if the individual biker is working hard, then they're making more money. And then uh, if you're taking it easy, you're not making as much money. So it's about how much work you want to put into it. And then um, if you're working for a bigger company, we have a small company, bigger companies might have lower rates. So it's, it's up to the individual to find a spot where they're comfortable. And I always tell kids that work for me and other people, it's like, why not get your own clients? You know, why, why are you working for me? Or, you know, instead of working for me, why don't you come and work with me? You know, and I'll do some of your clients work. You do some of my clients work. I'm always trying to uh, encourage people to be their own company because I think that's more sustainable than people working for a big company and looking for a mommy or a daddy to take care of them and pay for them. You know. So, so did you do you have a question? Yeah. Um, in addition to Kryptonite, for uh, messengers um, have low jacks or bike GPS tracking. Has that taken off within? The biking culture at all so if your bike does somehow get jacked you're able to still track it i mean i've only heard of it maybe jc knows more about that the the, the tracking stuff is probably for high-end bikes right like so maybe more the roadies would be into there that there is some uh, systems that you put in the frame itself yeah. and you can track it and some bikes they come in with the tracking but not all of them not yet. so it's something that is not really too popular or too uh as yeah, yeah, so it's kind of like new. Yeah, we did that a few years back in the Power Sport channel um, with motorcycles and scooters. Um, and it was tough because the changes in technology, completely separate from anything we were doing, just with the service providers, yeah. over the air changes, as soon as you had, um, like anything with electronics, as soon as you had something and it was in the hands of the customer, if they're not installing and updating regularly, their solution can be outdated so quickly. We ran into that as a challenge. I do know of a solution that's used in the UK um, in terms of the GPS being in the STEM, um, and that's really where I've heard the biggest movement around it. And I think the city bikes have GPS in them. I mean, the, the, the rental bikes in the city have they GPS in them. Yep. Yeah. So it's, I guess it's growing. I wasn't sure on that. Or like, um, sorry, there was another question. Oh. Um, I guess another question was, for bike messengers protecting themselves, do they ride with cameras um, as like, hey, you hit me, you, there's a full on camera. I haven't um, heard of that. I mean, a lot of bike messengers have GoPros and we're making, yeah, GoPro. we're well, we're making social media. Yeah. Safety. Yeah. Yeah. Safety. <laughs> I, my brothers drive motorcycles yeah, or ride motorcycles and it's big for them to like, hey, it's a safety issue. Oh, yeah, that, that's different. Like the same like in the cars now, the startup people start using the the, the camps, yeah. so they can always be filming uh, if any accident happens. And, more, and motorcycles happen. Yeah, too. I see more and more uh, police and detectives have body cams. So yeah. maybe it's that's just a matter of time, right? Yeah. <laughs> you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a question for Jeff from Portly. Yeah. All right. Um, like in the past. 20 years or so, like uh, the rise of track bikes also on the side, there's also been the rise of cargo bikes because of how the business is changing mm -hmm. and um, the packages are getting bigger where, yeah. you know, with technology, it's like there's less paperwork now. So now it's like, you know, more hard goods that are going, right. you know, clothes, stuff like that. Um, my question to you is, is um, to, to fill that need, um, is there anything coming down the R&D pipeline from Ortley that uh, is like uh, cargo bike specific? Yeah, actually we're having conversations with several major cargo brands, not the commercial ones, because most of the commercial guys are building their own tubs and they've got tarps and things that go over them, but people that are sort of in between um, being a consumer. Who is, is Bullet one of the brands that you're, that you're developing? Bullet's with? one of the brands that I think is probably more on the commercial side of things. They've probably got some of their own solutions already because every, every one of the companies that's using Bullet is probably delivering cases of beer or coffee or whatever. There's a lot of guys out there though that are, um, that are buying them for their own uses and stuff. 
Yeah, we've got solutions that fit into those those tubs already, but we're also talking to like Turn and Benno Bikes and um, Yuba, and we're looking at the racks, the extended racks that they're uh, using, and we're making sure that they're um, their rack systems are actually compatible with, with our hook systems and then now we're looking at what size and shape profiles we need to, to make because it's becoming more and more of a commercial product, I mean a, a consumer product as well because people are using them for shopping, they're replacing their minivan, they're taking their kids to school and so we're, we're definitely looking at uh, that marketplace as a growing edge for us, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Any more? Um, I'll keep it going to but is the we have four more minutes left. So uh, Kev, um, what's the okay. Kevin? Kevin. Oh, sure. more? Yeah. oh, go right ahead, sir. Uh, did you guys see a spike in business after the Jason Gordon Levitt movie? Oh, um, premium rush. You mean like bike messenger work? Well, yeah, well no. In um, so I worked at a bike shop in Harlem at the time. I noticed that like right after that, right before and after that movie. Like all of a sudden, that was like when Pure Fix was coming out. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden, I had like a hundred of them in the basement that I had to build. So I was wondering if you guys saw like ups in bags, locks, like kids going to alley cats that had no experience. And I saw. I went to Interbike for like ten years in a row. I haven't been in like five years, thank goodness. But uh, I did see I, when I first started going to Interbike, there wasn't really a fixed gear. Um, representation at the trade show and I don't know I'm, I'm, I bet I've hit my head a few times so I'm not good with the dates or whatever but it definitely it seemed to ex kind of explode over two years where all of a sudden you're at inner bike one year and people are laughing at your fixed gear bike and then two years later there's eight booths selling fixed gear bikes you know so <laughs> it was kind of surprising and I think it's gonna it, it's like people always love to see something new. I mean, what's the, the newest thing I heard is gravel. Now there's gravel bikes. And I was like, okay. It's like people on, people get interested in stuff and it gets big and then it goes away. But then I think the fixed gear thing is always gonna, it's probably had its peak of being a new thing, but it's it's still a, uh, a practical solution, you know? So I think it's always gonna have a, a strong place, you know? Like, hey, JC, you're here and you, you work for a track bike branch in LA. And, and I see, I think it's growing. I think the whole track bike thing is growing. More and more kids are getting into it. You know, may, maybe not mass, but it's still growing. Could you see? Yeah, that? I, I see that uh, the fixed gear is something like the BMX when it, it, it came out, you know? Like, it came and it stayed. I believe the fixed gear culture, it came and it's going to stay there forever because that's something that a lot of people enjoy riding it. Uh, not because they want to go real fast, but like we all said, it's very simple and it's, it's a really nice feeling when you're riding it. I mean, I don't know how many of you ride a fixed gear, but it's a really totally different ride to any other bike when you can cruise. This is, you become part of the bicycle because you always have constantly pedal, so the bicycle will keep moving. So if you stop pedaling, the bicycle will stop. So these are really unique uh, feeling that only the fixed gear bicycle is giving to you. So I think the fixed gear came and it won't go away. Great, there's more question back, over there, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I came in a little late, so I might have missed something you said already about bops. Um, I see a lot of people using the, the kryptonite minis uh, and they're just sort of carelessly locking their frame to the to the U, uh, you know, the kind of things we have in Philly here, the black, uh, whatever they're called. Stable. Bike racks. Okay. Uh, they're just locking it without locking the wheels. Mm -hmm. So um, do they all, I haven't looked, I mean, are they all using those special uh, the bolts that have a, different head that you have to have a special tool to take them off or they're just not worried about having their wheels copped? So it, is, so it can depend. So depending on, we never would advocate not locking wheel um, frame and rear wheel. That's always kind of the, the ideal lockup. You'll find people that are running in somewhere real quickly um, will sometimes just do a top tube lockup because they're walking into a store and they're coming out. I remember we when we first had a YouTube channel we did that and we said this is a quick, quick lockup. 
This is not what we recommend as the absolute lockup. I mean, the amount of feedback we would get on the video, like, how dare you put that out? You guys are kryptonite. And we're like, we said, this is like, there's times when you're literally running in to grab a water, you're on a ride or something, you can do that. So I don't know what the particular folks have or don't have that you're looking at. Oftentimes, you know, the people that buy the smaller minis generally know their frame size well and they know what they're going to lock to uh, throughout the course of a day. So they won't pick a really small lock not knowing what they can and can't get around in terms of the geometry and the real wheel. But um, to your point, uh, component security has really become a category that you hear about and see more and more. We do that. We have a system that's gravity-based. So you have for um, either uh, quick release wheel bolts um, or um, for uh, solid axle we have wheel nuts. And so you'll have people using a mini but we'll also have security for their wheels because wheel theft has become really big. Um, but yeah, not anything we recommend in terms of not trying to grab the rear wheel. And that's where, to the point of like the messenger project, that's where sometimes people find, oh, we need minis that are just two inches higher in length so we can capture the rear wheel and the frame. Yeah, I just thought it was ironic because I associate those with more experienced riders who know what they want. And yet, it's you know, usually the case. Up, so it's, yeah. it seems, seems strange. Yep, and, also, and also, just want to add a point. A lot of the inexperienced riders lock them up so carelessly that actually the bike falls down, gets in the way of locking up other bikes to the same, you know, thing. Yep. So it's, it's kind of annoying. Yeah. Yeah, most people are, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually, you know what? I'm going to hold off. Well, hold off. Okay, yeah. Um, your panelists and stick around for a couple minutes uh, if Absolutely. you guys have some more questions. Got some stickers if anyone wants a sticker. Yeah, our time is up, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you all. all right. Thank you. Thank you.